to Samuel for his help. So I'm going to call the members of the first panel, Dominique de Villepin, former Prime Minister of France. Uh, we, he can do without introduction, but also as a foreign minister, we remember his brilliant, uh, brave action in fighting unilateralism when there was the invasion of Iraq. Massimo D'Alema, our friend, former Prime Minister of Italy, former uh, foreign minister, a personal friend of us, including President Lula's, uh, the president of Imagine Africa, Pierre Sané. George Tayana, my dear friend and colleague, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Argentina, and today a representative in the Microsoft Parliament, my dear Lena Shawi, philosopher and professor of the School of Philosophy and Humanities of the University of Sao Paulo. Before uh, turning the floor, I'm going to follow the same order. This order has nothing to do with hierarchy or anything. We are just trying to connect uh, some uh, topic, affinity of topics, and uh, a bit of uh, the geographic distribution. Well, we, uh, for those that worked in the United Nations, uh, this is kind of a habit. But anyway. Uh, each uh, speaker will have 15 to 20 minutes so that everybody will have the chance to talk. And then immediately after the presentations, uh, no, we are going to have a break for coffee. So we are going to have 15 to 20 minutes for each one of you, and then we will break for coffee. So it's a great honor to turn the floor to Dominique de Villepin. I'm not going to give him responsibilities that are ours. But uh, somehow, he is guilty for the seminar to be held. A great friend. And it proves that uh, you know, love for democracy and fighting the unipolar world goes beyond restricted political. Esta invitación y, y esta oportunidad de... With you this topic that is so important, which is the issue of democracy, multilateralism, but of course, bearing in mind the fact that today we are doing something very important in Brazil. And I think this is the first message I want to leave you with. And the reason why I'm uh, saying that for almost two weeks now with Uh, many people throughout the world, that what is happening now in Brazil is of utmost importance. And you have to be thoroughly aware that what is happening in Brazil is something that is important for beyond Brazil. And that's why people are looking at the challenge. time, the world is counting on Brazil. The world is counting on Brazil because we see everywhere, and also here, of course, fear, hate, hatred, I'm sorry, and political violence that is growing. And this is the greatest danger for democracy. There are three unbalances 
that are important in the world today, and they all affect uh, the country of Brazil. The first is a geopolitical unbalance. that is leading the world today, um, uh, the United States, was just uh, going, uh, appearing. And because of that, many tensions in the world uh, are happening. Uh, people are thinking, who is going to be the next greatest country in the world? The United States going down, China is going up. What happens is that the United States uh, does not want, do not want to lose power. They are playing very hard. Uh, Donald Trump uh, is it, not is just the start of that. They do not want to change. The policy of the U.S. is started before Donald Trump, and it will continue later on, which is to make. China not succeed to be the first power in the world. Of course, it is a complete fight, and it is a fight that has uh, the importance of militarism. It is a combat that has an importance in terms of technology. All commercial tariffs uh, have as a driver the technological ambition of China that the United States wants to halt. And in view of that, there is a world tension uh, that is uh, greater than ever before, because the United States and Donald Trump are not afraid to fight the institutions that created the world order after 1945 which is a democratic multilateral order, of course. Uh, 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 things didn't happen exactly as people thought. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, people thought it was the end of the world and democracy was going to be everywhere. Of course, this is not how things happen. They shouldn't, anyway. So once again, we are in face of a classical of, uh, uh, history that the United States and the Trump administration think that chaos favors the United States. And therefore, they fight the rules. They fight the institutions. They criticize uh, the international treaties, uh, the agreement for 2021. And that's it. They go against order and stability. They go against COP21. The second um, imbalance is ideological. We are going through a global ideology where you have a populist conservatism. Uh, I would say almost uh, a suprematism. Uh, thinking that there are countries that are more important than others, that can boss others around that are social uh, groups that can uh, boss others, and there are colors of skin that are better than others. This situation is a factor that creates danger for what uh, means solidarity in between people, in between countries. And the third uh, factor of imbalance is the fact that inequalities are growing everywhere in the world. We are watching a major difference that is growing day by day between the elites and the people, rich and poorer countries. And it is true amongst countries and inside countries. We see that in Europe between centers and outskirts and the ultra-liberal administration 
grants the rich to be richer without doing anything, and the poor should just pay for the price of uh, them getting richer. And we have to have this situation in mind when we see what is going on here in Brazil. Because Brazil was uh, or has been in recent years a very important player in the international game. And this, of course, is something that we owe to the work of President Lula, to the work of Celso Morin, and Brazil's affirmation as an international player, which led to many, many changes. Basically, to have the emerging countries gathered in BRICS, which was a great feat. It was not only the United States, the European countries that were in the center of uh, the world game. The BRICS, little by little, started to deal with the wants of the whole of the world. And also, Brazil committed to seek for justice, peace, democracy in the world, opening to the Middle East, opening to Africa, which really changed the way of seeing, the perception of the objectives of the international society. And the third element that is so important is uh, to seek for social justice in this country. Each one of you knows better than myself the invisible walls that existed and that ex still exist in this country and attack those invisible walls for Brazil to be a true nation, to reconcile with its history. And this is a major challenge for everyone in this country to hope for a better future. And that was a major change that was made by President Lula. Uh, uh, the friendship and solidarity between Chirac and Lula because of the recognition of what Brazil was giving to the world in terms of stability justice, new ideas, because we need imagination in the world. We cannot just accept things as they are, but rather try and get a better thing. And uh, today, this is the second thing I would like to talk about. We are going through a point of inflection in Brazil, a point of inflection that uh, Brazil has to either choose the way of democracy, continue respecting the demands and the rules of democracy, which is uh, really respond to its people. Or, on the other hand, it goes towards political violence, more hatred, more fear, and this is something that we know in Latin America uh, and in other countries that took the adventure. It is an endless adventure, and it is to move backwards in history. And right now, we should understand that the fight here is a fight that we Europeans also share. The situation of democracy in Europe especially when you're talking about the eastern center part of Europe in countries like Hungary, Poland, Hungary. It is a challenge also for the European Union. And of course, uh, we always uh, are tempted to polarize things, to point figures, to eliminate things. But in this world of the 21st century, the issue is, is it better to polarize or to try and seek dialogue, the possibility of trying to understand why things are happening, what is behind the why. In Europe, it is 
fear because of problems that were not sufficiently addressed. The problem of migration that you know now with the uh, people from Venezuela coming from Brazil in the northern part of the country. This is a problem that we are experiencing in Europe every day in the year of 2015. One million people coming from the Middle East, from Yemen, from Syria, coming into Europe. And we have to respond to that. We cannot just respond with ideology. We have to have economic responses. We have to have social responses. And we have to have democratic responses. And this is what Brazil is fancy now. This is the democratic challenge of Brazil, which is, again, of utmost importance. And I could say in other parts of the world, in Africa and Asia, this is happening. We see that the line of separation between democracy and authoritarian regimes is growing. And it's quite surprising to say that today there are many situations that it seems that authoritarian regimes seem to be more effective. They seem to be controlling society better. And that is the challenge of democracy, the capacity of giving concrete answers to problems, to move on, to get to progress, to say to people that we can advance with democracy and share the growth of economy and social improvements. And the last point I would like to mention is that in this crisis of democracy, we have to understand that uh, this is a crisis of uh, rules. We have uh, to address this disorder that is going on in the minds of people. This crisis is because of the fact that there are new ideologies that are very effective today. The ultra-liberalism that wants to give the feeling that uh, uh, everybody is going to deal without any rules. The conservative populism, like Trump, that thinks that with promises, with words, and with responding to the elites, and with the growing of the economy inside that is uh, stopping the rest of the world in favor of the United States, everything is going to be OK. To think technologically, because uh, thinking that technology is going to solve it all, we are in a world in which politics is more important than ever. In the 80s, in the 90s, in the 2000s, we thought that the economy was going to solve all the world's problems. No, it is politics, the capacity to reconcile energies and to give a vision of future. This is what is the most important thing. And we cannot forget another ideology that is very strong, which is the social networks. That, uh, make us to be in a world of post-truth. We can say any nonsense in the social media. Everyone believes it all because one idea just counterattacks the others. And therefore, we have to have in mind the lessons of history for us not to repeat the same mistakes over and over again the mistakes we made in the past. In this world, we see that the rule, rules suffered a lot. And the first suffering of rules was thinking that uh, uh, rules would just be to apply to technologically. Our German friends 
but that Europe was going to do very well if we had austerity for the whole of the Union. And the Greek paid a dear price for that. Orthodox rules are not enough because behind the rules we have to understand that there are people, people who are hungry, people who have problems, and we cannot satisfy everything with a cold perspective of rules. The second problem of rules is proliferations, the democratic rules that uh, spread without being understood. People need to have clear objectives, three, four, five, and the rules have to support these objectives so that the journey is understood. And then we can measure progresses on the way. And the third crisis of rules is legitimacy. We are seeing that uh, in the fight between democratic and authoritarian regimes, the capacity to convince authoritarian regimes today is greater in some countries. When you see what's going on in the Philippines, for example, in which you can say anything without any limits in which human lives uh, don't matter. It is just the ideology that uh, has worse. And this is a problem. And therefore, we have to have a human rule. And that has to be the core of democracy. And I'm going to close with a conviction of mine. Uh, we all have uh, your history. Uh, we, Brazilians and the French, share an important history. For more than five centuries, France was always looking at Brazil. When the Protestants came to Brazil and shared the hope of this country, and also with the French Revolution and positivism. Celso was uh, reminding me yesterday the three elements of Brazilian motto, love, order, and progress. Well, love came later. <laughs> but that's it. The rule has to have a principle. It's love, solidarity, it is sharing a common history. But it's also common democratic life that needs basis. And basis is order. Order is the shared rule to the benefit of all. And also, we need a driver, we need an objective which is progress, and the capacity of, again, put history in movement and have politics to the service of people. So once again, this is what can give strong hope to Brazil once again. And that's why I'm very optimistic when I look at Brazil and the future of this country. The country will be able to raise again with hope. You've had in recent years the mission of President Lula to change things in this country, but change together with the world. He gave us all a lesson that is important to each one of us. We may think that uh, we have uh, the solution, we may challenge solution, but we have to think what is important to everyone. And this will be important for Brazil to continue to be Brazil, the Brazil we need as Europeans, as citizens of the world. So thank you very much to be working for a future. We'll be able to share all together with one another a new hope in this country 
and also a new shared hope with the rest of the world and with Europe. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll hand over quickly. I don't have any pretense to to summarize, but I think some of the thoughts that it would be worth highlighting for the debate. One of them regards the question that Minister Villatam mentioned. So this new situation, China-US, is something new since the Second World War. For the first time, the United States are not, do not have, explicitly do not have a project for the world. So if it's good for us, it's good for everyone. They don't have, of course, there are projects, implicit projects, but there is no, after the Second World War, the creation of the UN, the, the, the WTO later on, etc. But the US has no project for the world as a whole right now. So regarding authoritarianism, we're talking a lot about politics, but there's a problem which is the expansion of fascism within societies. And this is something that in Brazil is mirrored in many aspects. So, for example, the universities, the attitude of authorities, especially including the judiciary in relation to our universities. So, so President Glazy mentioned this. How will the military behave? I don't want to... Uh, uh, speak anymore. Uh, no, let's let's hear from Massimo D'Alema now. Good morning. Uh, thank you. I, I'm going to speak in English because I don't speak Portuguese and my English is a little bit better than my Spanish. And uh, while it's strange to speak in English for me in Sao Paulo, which is the biggest Italian city in the world. <laughs> but, well, <laughs> but in any case, English is international language. Well, I, I totally agree that we are truly, truly facing a dramatic crisis of the system of multilateral institutions of, and governance through which we hoped to make the world a more orderly, peaceful place. In the vast majority of cases, the United Nations is paralyzed by disagreement between the great powers leading to extreme difficulty in peacemaking in crucial areas of the world. I'm thinking of the lost, lasting conflict in Syria and the chaos and civil war in Libya, to only mention crises which directly affect the security and interests of Europe and of my country, Italy. Very often, large global or regional powers act in these crises in response to their own national interests <coughs> and therefore tend to fuel conflicts instead of facilitating solutions. But also the global financial institutions are encountering more and more difficulty. The WTO will almost certainly have to deal with the effects of an American decision to withdraw from the organization and the generally accepted rules of global trade. Nationalism, protectionism are playing a larger and larger role on the international scene. First and foremost, because today that is the position of the United States, the world's largest power. American policy, but also the assertive nationalism and power politics of Putin is making the world more insecure and conflicts more difficult to control. The European Union itself, for decades a positive example of supranational integration and a regional pillar of a multilateral system of global governance, is currently undergoing a profound crisis. This crisis is expressed first and foremost in European citizens' growing lack of confidence in the Union. 
which seems to be unable to generate economic growth, social cohesion, as it successfully did for 50 years after the Second World War. At the same time, the EU is no longer able to bring its member states together in a united front in response to international crisis. The most dramatic evidence of this has been the asylum seeker emergency and the problem of migratory flows in general with many countries refusing to take joint responsibility, helping to trigger a nationalist reaction and a xenophobic campaign against refugees. Not only in Hungary, unfortunately, but also in my own country, in Italy. I could go on, but I think I have said enough to illustrate the gravity of the crisis affecting multilateralism and the serious threat this crisis represents to the progress and peace of the whole world. We must ask ourselves where this crisis originated. In my opinion, we should quite frankly acknowledge that this system of multilateral institutions was extremely fragile in that this fragility became apparent when, after the end of the Cold War and the bipolar, bipolar world order, the multilateral system was called upon to govern the challenge of the headlong growth of the world economy and a dramatic technological revolution. From his prison in the early 30s of the past century, Antonio Gramsci, pinpointed the contradiction between the global nature of the economy and the strictly national character of politics, and predicted that this contrast would become more and more stark and unsustainable. And so it has proved to be. Let us admit the truth in the 90s and up until 2007, 2008 crisis, even the left, at least in the Western world, was influenced by an ingenuously optimistic vision of globalization. The prevailing idea was that the global economy would bring benefits to all and the world would unite under the banner of the market economy and democracy. Certainly, the dominant ideology in the United States of Bill Clinton and social democratic Europe was liberalism, tempered by the values of solidarity of the socialist and Christian tradition. We must recognize that this vision led people, led us, I, I, I'm talking about myself also, <laughs> led us to undervalue inequalities, conflicts, contradictions. We must recognize that in actual fact, globalization led to the accumulation of a huge financial wealth and thus huge power concentrated in just a few hands beyond all political control, while on the other hand, especially in Europe and the United States, Labor was devaluated as pay and job security fell, and the pressure of global competition eroded the safeguards, safety nets, and social gains achieved over a century of struggle. This was the start of the emptying out of democracy, triggered by this powerlessness of politics against the dominion of what has been called global financial capitalism. For our parents' generation, the fight for democracy was mainly fought against fascist dictatorship. While in the East, in the post-war years, people struggled for democracy against Stalinist dictatorship of one-party rule. In Europe, after the war, the fight for democracy was above all against the fascist military regime in Portugal, Greece, and Spain. In Latin America, in your country, you have 
had to fight for many years against military dictatorships and many coups which have constantly hampered your country's political evolution. Today, the context has, is uh, very different because democracy can be hollowed out, restricted, and manipulated even without removing the shell of formal rules which apparently guarantee citizens' rights. The democratic left has rejected in its history a dogmatic tradition in which a critique of formal democracy led to the theory of dictatorship and one-party rule. We know how that doctrine degenerated and we have seen the historic failure that led to the end of the Soviet experiment in real socialism. But this does not mean that Marx's criticism of the limitations of formal democracy have not proved valid. And that they are not still a useful tool for understanding the contradictions of contemporary capitalism. It is in fact evident that without social inclusion, without social justice, without reducing inequalities, and thus remove the obstacle, democracy runs the risk of being reduced to a set of rules that hide the real dominance of the property-owning classes. In The Price of Inequality, Joseph Stiglitz denounces the, the situation of the American democracy, which, uh, he, which was founded on the principle, he, he wrote, on the principle of one person, one, one vote, but now seems to be based on one dollar, one vote principle. After all, in a world in which a dozen of so individuals own the same amount of wealth as the poorest half of humanity, some individuals, it is hard to believe that everyone has the same political influence and the same power. The growth of inequalities, the social exclusion of a part of population, and the uncontrolled power of finance are the main reasons for the crisis of democratic systems. Both because the nation state where democracy operates have lost real power in relation to the financial markets and because due to technologies, the potential for holder of wealth to manipulate and direct public opinion has grown enormously. Political alienation and the crisis of political parties, trade unions and the bodies which once acted as social intermediaries, together with the growing power of the traditional new media, make it possible to influence people's choices and interfere with the functioning of the most delicate democratic mechanism starting from the electoral choices. A few weeks ago, the great Spanish writer and commentator Javier Cercas writing in El País compared today's world to the forest of deceit, pointing out that untrust exert more power than ever before, partly due to the effects of the new media. In his uh, fine book, Truth Will Prevail, Lula points out that the World Wide Web can be used and is used as an extraordinary effective means of spreading hatred. This is a right assessment that describes the situation in many countries. At the same time, it is clear that those who control the web have access to the personal data of millions of people. And this, is, this can be used improperly, not only to shape 
consumption choices for economic gain, but also to direct political and electoral choices. Similarly, social media can spread fake news and encourage people to believe in not only in politics, but also in other areas, such as the campaign against vaccination. My country. I'm not talking about the theoretical traits. This is really happening. As personal data was used for electoral purposes in the latest American presidential elections. Operation of this type occur in Europe too. I'd like to give you an example from my own country, Italy. A few months ago, when there was a disagreement over the formation of, of the government between the chairman of Republic, President of Republic, Sergio Mattarella, and the parties which had won the elections, the president was the target of a very violent media campaign involving social media campaign, involving not just criticism, but also insults and threats. The Italian judiciary is investigating, starting from the fact that a large proportion of these attacks came from domains registered abroad, from Russia, from Oman. That's incredible. What does mean? Obviously, as well as the problem of fake news, there is the problem of fake personal profile. Clearly, anyone with resources, with money and power, can register hundreds of thousands <coughs> of fake domains and has an imm immense firepower which can strongly influence the opinion formed on the social media. And by this mechanism, they can also affect what is said on television <coughs> and in the newspapers. I'm not describing these scenarios to criminalize the social media, but to underline that the web, which can be an important way of enabling citizens to participate and directly express their point of view, and thus of expanding democracy, in reality runs the risk of becoming a tool for manipulating and poisoning public life in the hands of an anonymous power held by a very few, or even a tool which lets foreign powers interfere in the public life and choice of other countries. Because it's without rules and without control. Well, therefore economic and financial power can bend the hold of the new media in its own interests, making them an instrument of domination. In this machine of power succeed if this machine of power succeeds in influence, in influencing the organs of the state, bureaucracy, judiciary, and by force, then politics and the institutions may actually become ineffective, even if democracy remains formally in place. It no longer takes the violence of military coup d'etat to change a country's political direction. As we have unfortunately seen, a well-orchestrated campaign of slander supported by a powerful, pervasive, almost totalitarian media machine, a pliant judiciary prepared to play along and the worst, must and democratic party, part of the political class, can join forces to change the history of a great country. Like it they are trying to do, at least in Brazil. This is why we are deeply concerned by what is happening in Brazil. The very serious attack against the presidential candidate Jair Bolsonaro is an alarming sign of the climate of tension in which this campaign takes place. The voice of all Brazilian Democrats and all friends of your people must be raised against any form 
of violence. Everything possible must be done to be done to cre create the conditions for a truly democratic confrontation. Also because Brazil is a great country whose importance on the world scene has strongly increased. Honestly, everyone should recognize that if we have reached this point is also because the president of the Republic was hounded by her office by a procedure which is clearly illegitimate. And the former president Lula was arrested after a sham trial without evidence. The exclusion for the upcoming presidential election in spite of the ruling of the appeal of the United Nations Committee of Human Rights of the candidate who, who enjoyed the greatest popular support constituted a, I don't say a coup d'etat, but something similar in a new modern form. And they are a dramatic warning sign, not only for Brazil, also because the rule of worker parties and ruler was important, innovative example of the fight against inequality, hunger and poverty, and therefore on the fight to build a more authentic democracy in Latin America's largest country. Well, this is why we believe that we, we must do something in order to support the fight of Brazilian Democrats. Yesterday, together with Quatemo Cardenas, we met Lula in Curitiba. I had met Lula uh, many times in the last uh, three decades. I can say <coughs> the man prisoner in a small room in the federal police district in Curitiba is a little bit thin stretched, injured by the injustice he's suffering, but uh, is not fundamentally different from the man I met uh, several times in Planalto. He has the same vision, the same lucid determination. He's not a man folded up on himself. He has talked with us more about anger in the world than about his personal incredible judicial affair. You know him better than me. He's a fighter. And he understands very well the stakes. Is democracy at stake in Brazil? and not the victory of one or another political party. Lula understands that he can make a great contribution to the freedom of his country, even from the cell in which he is restricted. And I believe Fernando Haddad has a great responsibility, a great opportunity. He can count on the strong and sincere support of Lula and also, of course, of many, many Brazilians and also on the support of many friends of Brazil in the world. Because the stakes in the next Brazilian presidential elections is not only to resume a path of social justice, but also democracy and rule of law. Uh, many, many years ago, the man who was my political teacher, political guide, uh, I don't know if you remember his, his name, Enrico Berlinguer, he was the leader of the Communist Party, Italian Communist Party, addressing a cold, hostile audience at the Soviet Communist Party in Moscow, told them that democracy is universal value. Universal value. And uh, 
for that, we supported the, the right to demand democracy for the men and women living under the oppressive Eastern European regimes. And we rejected the idea that criticizing the political situation in those countries was an unacceptable form of interference. I don't want to, to, to compare Brazil with the Soviet Union of Brezhnev, of course. It's a different situation. But I want to stress that democracy is now more than ever an universal value, a conquest threatened and not taken for granted. This is why I think is important what's going to happen in Brazil. The world in many countries is moving in the wrong direction. The sign which may come from Brazil, a, I trust it will come, is a sign of hope. It's the message that it's possible to resist and to reverse the trend. This is uh, in your hand, and uh, you can count on the solidarity and on the support of many comrades and many Democrats in the world. Thank you. Try. I, I'm going to ask you to try to stick to 15 minutes, if possible, so that we have some time for coffee and, and to talk a bit amongst each other. It's so important to hear what you have to say that I'm going to continue uh, without interrupting you. I'm not going to dare uh, to interrupt you. But I ask you dearly to... Uh, uh, of course, that is, you know, uh, when you talked about the universality of the concept of democracy, this reference to the financial capital, the world capital, the concentration of capital is so much important, and perhaps it's food for our debate later on. And then when you talked about the new media, in Brazil, we suffer a lot with the old media, the old uh, means of communication that uh, produce fake news all the time. So this also has to be taken into consideration. But we are going to go straight to Pierre Sané of 15 minutes if possible, please. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Dear friend uh, said so. Let me take this opportunity to thank also the Foundation Perso Abramo, uh, its president. Thank you. Thank you. Its president, its yes. director general, and uh, also Mila Frati, who took care of all the uh, arrangement. Uh, let me thank also Instituto Lula and its director, Tamires Sampaio, and of course, the PT. Uh, now, presidential elections are coming soon. Uh, the most popular candidate from the left is arrested and thrown in jail on trumped up charges. There's a reaction of international courts which request the government to uh, release the prisoner and allow him to run for president. The courts react and talk about national sovereignty 
and the Supreme Court confirms that that candidate will not be able to run for elections. Sounds familiar? Which country? Senegal. My own country. Senegal imported two things from Brazil. Borsa Familiares to uh, accelerate the fight against poverty, and it seems that it is quite successful. And the judicial way to run a democratic electoral competition. So that's why the outcome of what is going on in Brazil is important for us in Africa, because if it works, then many African countries will use the judiciary in order to uh, arbitrate political competition. And that's why uh, ensuring uh, uh, a positive outcome in Brazil is of importance to uh, many African countries and many African activists. Now, having said that, since I am an unreconstructed optimist, like all human rights campaigners, uh, I would like to share six points with you using the work of uh, John Keane, who wrote uh, recently a book that I would recommend. It is called The Life and Death of Democracy. And he looks at democracy over a 5,000 year period in order to give us some perspective whenever we talk about crisis and attacks against uh, democracy. Uh, democracy today, I think, is really a global aspiration. Whether you are in uh, uh, Myanmar, in uh, South Africa, in Venezuela, in the United States, in all the countries where I have been, where I have met ordinary people, where as a campaigner with Amnesty International, I have met prisoners, uh, I have met market women. Today, they know about their rights. They know about human rights. They know that when they are picked up by the police and beaten up in a police station, something was wrong and the law was broken, and they know about that. So it is really a global aspiration founded on universal values of human rights. And human rights are universal. The validation that this global aspiration, which is democracy, came in 1947 with the birth of the Indian nation, which proved that a country can be non-Western country, can be a poor country, can be illiterate country, and still have a functioning democracy. And this is almost 70 years now. So the validation that democracy really is a global aspiration was given to all of us by the Indian independence and the Indian experience. The Indians got rid of the colonial uh, occupation, regain their freedom, and instead of going back to the, 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 the kingdoms that they had, they decided instead to adopt democracy, parliamentary democracy, and that democracy has sustained Indian political life since 1947. And the final nail to the coffin that no, democracy is just a Western concept that we are trying to impose on other countries was given by South Africa in 1994, the first non-racial elections where voters lined up for hours to cast their ballot. So you cannot tell those black voters who for the first time in their life could 
vote and participate in the democratic process, that no democracy is not uh, a value that, uh, that uh, uh, something that uh, you value, it is a foreign concept. And throughout those years in Africa, since the independence 1960s, all those who have fought for democracy, who have been jailed, who have been killed, who have been abducted, fighting for democracy, you cannot tell them democracy is not for you, it is a foreign concept. So democracy really, to me, today is a global aspiration. Now, uh, John Keane gives an interesting definition of democracy. He says, it is the government of the humble, by the humble, for the humble. Which means that in a democratic regime, power is not exercised by those who have wealth, those who were uh, anointed by, by God, uh, and those who come by uh, force. But rather, because it is one person, one vote, it is the government, like he says, of the humble, by the humble, and for the humble. And when I look at that definition, I think at two politicians who, to me, are the personification of this definition of democracy, which is Nelson Mandela and Lula. Now, if we look at democracy from an historical uh, perspective, and again, I'm referring to John Keane, and it dates the birth of democracy 5,000 years ago, before Athens. It talks about uh, the Middle East, Africa, then Greece, Rome, and it talks about assembly democracy. And we still have this type of democracy in Africa. Uh, in some villages, what we call l'arbre à palabre. It is the tree around which the elders will deliberate until they find an agreement. There is no majority minority. They have to find an agreement before they finish their deliberation. So the deliberation can take some time. It is helped by large doses of palm wine and by the local cannabis. But it is reserved for the elders. Of course, if you have goodies like that, you would exclude women, you would exclude the youth, and you reserve those goodies for the elders. But usually, they come with an agreement, and that is what l'arbre à palabre, form of uh, democracy, assembly democracy, is all about. That's the old forms of democracy. Then we have representative democracies, and now we are in an era of participatory democracy. It's not just sufficient to cast your ballot every four years or every five years. What you want, you want public scrutiny and public control of the decision makers with various kinds of uh, watchdogs, NGOs, the press, the judicial system, and the international system, like the UN. The UN bodies, like the Human Rights Committee, uh, the, the, the United Nations Human Rights Committee, is part of the national democratic process because governments who ratify the international covenant on civil and political rights have agreed to internalize that legislation. And therefore, when the UN makes a rule, it is not a foreign rule, it is part of the domestic legislation taken for arbitration to a body that brings together 195 governments. And governments that have ratified the protocol the facultative protocol of the, uh, of the uh, uh, covenant have an obligation to implement that. If they don't implement that, they lose face. They lose 
their standing, they lose their credibility in the international system because as member of the international system, and especially for a country like Brazil, a senior active member of the international system in the field of human rights, you cannot tomorrow tell another rogue state that they should respect human rights when you are not respecting the injunction given to you by the uh, Human Rights uh, Committee. And the Human Rights Committee is an embodiment of the international commitment to sustain, to protect human rights everywhere. Governments who are party to that treaty have an obligation to respect it, otherwise it's a breakdown of the international system of law and, and uh, order. Now, having said that, <clears throat> having said that, uh, yes, democracy is a global aspiration. The democratic forms are changing from assembly democracy to representative democracy to today participatory democracy where people want more than just sending people who make decisions on their behalf. They want accountability. They want control. They want scrutiny. They want participation in the, the decision making. And Brazil was a champion. I mean, I've, I've, I've uh, worked with uh, Porto Alegre on the development of this participatory budget uh, in uh, UNESCO. I've also worked with Porto Alegre on the launch of the World Social Movement, which has now uh, uh, national uh, chapters. And all those innovations coming from Brazil uh, uh, put Brazil in, 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 in a leadership role when it comes to the strengthening of uh, democracy, when it comes to the uh, uh, protection and constitutionalization of social, economic, and uh, cultural uh, rights, and uh, when it comes to the third one, the, the ownership of the national resources. National resources are owned by the people and entrusted to the state to use it to the benefit of the people. So all those elements which constitute really the, uh, the uh, manifesto of uh, the PT are, are, are things that we, I'm talking about activists, I'm a member of the Socialist Party of Senegal, we as activists look at as examples. So we want those examples. We, don't, we want the bolsa familiares, but we don't want the judicialization of the political competition by throwing in jail competitors who are stronger than you are. That's totally unfair. Now, of course, we also want to emulate Brazil in football, and our big dream is to beat Brazil one day, <laughs> and we will not rest <laughs> until we achieve that big dream. Now, today's threat, I want to quote uh, from, uh, I want to quote from a recent article, a research uh, coming from uh, Sweden, from Swedish uh, researchers. Uh, trying to explain the rise of the uh, extreme right in uh, Sweden. You have probably followed the, uh, the uh, preparation of the election the and the preparation of the election and the threat of the Sweden uh, Democrats, a party coming from the far right. And the general explanation has been that it's because of the uh, influx of a migrant in uh, Sweden, which has led to the attractiveness of this alt-right party. Now, this study came out uh, just uh, three days ago, 
uh, I can give the uh, reference to whoever is interested, but the, the researchers are saying that uh, in 2006, a new center-right government took aim at Sweden's famed welfare state, reducing, reducing unemployment and sickness and disability benefits. So this government came in 2006 and they cut into the welfare state in order to fund what? Tax cuts. Classical. Okay? So then the crisis of 2008 arrived, causing big job losses, particularly among people who had already become less secure in the labor market. So the rise of the Sweden Democrats came long before the influx of the immigrants. It came from cuts in the social services. Micro, my, micro. It, cut, it came from cuts in the social services in order to reduce tax, the classical neoliberal uh, agenda. And in the crisis of 2008, lack of protection from the, the and, and this government was a, a, a center right government, but uh, center, let's say a little bit to the right, but center, because in Sweden, it's been governed by the Social Democrats for uh, almost 100 years, so even center rights in Sweden would be considered elsewhere as a uh, center party. Now, because these parties have implemented these neoliberal policies, especially in a country with a long tradition, 100 years tradition of social democratic rule, uh, welfare state, etc. the electorate looked for alternative. And the alternative was the Sweden Democrat, who got, I think, almost 18% uh, in the final count, but also to the left, Communist Party, etc. So looking outside of the traditional parties. So that is what explains. Now, of course, yeah, after that, since the migrants are there, you need the scapegoats, you need to divert the uh, attention. Uh, in Mexico, in, uh, in uh, Sweden, it was uh, Afghan, Syrian, etc. In the United States, it is uh, Mexican. In France, it is the Arabs. So you need really to focus the attention of the population on these uh, people coming from uh, outside. They are not part of us. And it is because of them that things are bad. We need to go back to when the times were, were uh, more comfortable, when we were amongst ourselves. If need be, why not go back to military dictatorship like we hear some say here totally irresponsibly in, uh, in Brazil. They have certainly not lived those times. That's why they are calling, calling that. Now. Uh, yes, even though it is a global aspiration, and even though we have made really progress, I think if you look at the map of the world today, you see that democracy is not in recess. Democracy continue to move forwards. Now you have some 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 ups and down. You have some resistance, like in China, for instance, but. Those who are fighting for democracy are on the right side of history. And history is always a struggle. You have progress, you have setbacks, you have revolutionaries, you have reactionaries, and that applies to, to uh, democracy. If I take the case of Africa, for instance, in the 1960s, at the time of uh, independence, most countries who had adopted the constitution of the colonial regime adopted a democratic constitution, many of them parliamentarian for the 
English speaking world or the French system, uh, the Fifth Republic. That's the 1960s. Then the 1970s, that's the period of the military coup throughout Africa. Most countries went through uh, military coup and then uh, abolition of uh, democracy. And when after 10 years they did not succeed in moving development forward, the World Bank came in. And the same way as the military, they tried to, to, to destroy politics by removing development agenda and development policies from the political agenda and deciding that the experts from the World Bank and from the country would be the one to decide the policy agenda. That didn't work. And the 90s, we have a return of uh, uh, democracy and the struggle continues. Now governments are adopting more sophisticated means. At least they are not killing people, uh, political opponents in the street. They are sending them into exile, they are sending them to jail, but people come out of jail. And with the progress of education, uh, it is more and more difficult for government to sustain in the autocratic uh, uh, way. Now, if we look, therefore, at the threats today, well, one threat is neoliberalism that is waging war on population throughout the world. Uh, the other threat, uh, we say, I've seen some literature say that another major threat to uh, democracy today is the loss of party membership. Uh, but that is not inevitable. I live half of the year in London, and I can see today the Labour Party in the UK has 500,000 members. It is the largest political party in Europe, where they had, before Corbyn, they had 120,000. Today they have 500,000 members, especially young members. So it depends really on the message and on the commitment, especially those political parties on the left. A political party on the left taking power and implementing neoliberal agenda is a treason. So therefore, it is not uh, surprising that people will, 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 uh, uh, will not trust the political establishment anymore because we have lied to them. I mean, we have to be honest and tell them, given the circumstances, given globalization, given da 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 this is what we want to do, this is what we can do, bear with us, it will take two, three, four, five years, and after that we will make things better. But we cannot make promises and then take over government and implement the policies that our adversaries in the neoliberal camp wanted to adopt. So if that is the case, we let them do it, and we keep in the opposition, continue to, to push them. So that will, I think, increase uh, the, um, the... The other threat, of course, but here I think the major powers have learned their lessons from history, is that you cannot impose democracy by force thinking that by bombing Iraq or bombing uh, Afghanistan, you will bring democracy to the people is, 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 I don't understand how you can think that. I mean, for me, it's, it's, it has to be people who have not read history book, who don't understand politics, who don't understand societies. These are things that are brought within the country and people fight in order to have their own model of democracy, but thinking that you can impose democracy by force and putting that as a legitimation of your invasion of another country for the resources is a delusion, complete delusion. So I hope that now we have learned from that 
and that countries in the south, and here I'm talking about Africa, because it has been the first destination for interventions in the name of humanitarian intervention, but we know that it has nothing to do with humanitarian intervention. It has whole to do with control of natural resources. And then it is couched in terms of we are bringing democracy. Like during colonization, we are bringing civilization. So that discourse now really doesn't fly anymore. So we hope now that those former colonizers in Africa will now learn from the lessons of the, the failure of all those interventions that have led to endless killings that have facilitated the rise of extremism, including Islamist uh, extremism, will stop these humanitarian intervention. It is better to work prevent, to prevent the need for an intervention by ensuring protection of uh, human rights. After that, if it doesn't work, we have to make sure that whoever commit a crime will be, will be tried in international tribunal. The, the fight against impunity is the best tool to prevent these massive cri crimes in, uh, in uh, conflicts in uh, Africa. We don't need intervention. Uh, I think that within Africa, with the African Union, with uh, uh, ECOWAS and regional bodies, we have mechanism that will allow us to deal with those conflicts. Yes, there will be conflicts. Yes, it will be violent, but we have to make our own history. So the, in terms of, now, the last two points. Uh, yes, we have this crisis of uh, democracy, crisis of legitimacy, but it is heartening to see the resistance. When I look at the United States, I'm not amazed by, by, by Trump, because, uh, uh, but I'm amazed by the resistance. I'm amazed to see the number of black women candidates for the next election in November. I'm amazed to see the number of Latina women candidates for the next election. They have understood, and once again, that's why I like this formula by John Keane, the government of the humble by the humble for the humble. So we have the rise of these humble in the United States, the young, the, 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 the black women, Latino, LGBT, indigenous, uh, Indian uh, American, who are all running for office, not just in the federal Congress, but also in the National Congress, et cetera. And all these people were actually empowered by Trump. If it was not Trump, they would not be engaged in politics. And I think this new wave is going to change politics in the United States. And I think after Trump, something better, something great will emerge from uh, the United States. I had a meeting yesterday with the, uh, with the uh, 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 Brazilian uh, African movement. Uh, I think it's called the uh, uh, Movimiento uh, Negro. Negro. Well, the, the, the black movement in, uh, in Brazil. And they, they, they gave me two information that I, well, one I knew was that uh, according to them, uh, maybe 54% of the population in Brazil identifies as black. And the other information I didn't know was that voting is compulsory in Brazil. So it is not like in the United States, et cetera, where actually people are prevented from voting or they just decide not to vote and only 40% turn up to elect the president. Here, if voting is compulsory and if the majority of the electorate is black, so, and the black people understand that their interest is best defended by the PT, then the movement should have as its ambition to mobilize the black community throughout Brazil from the Northeast to the favelas to make sure that one, 
They understand where their interest is. They just have to look at what happened in the past in terms of uh, uh, poverty, in terms of uh, uh, affirmative action, in terms of electricity for all, etc. Who is best suited to defend their interest? And they should go and vote. So they have really to mobilize, to educate, to knock at doors everywhere to make sure that the electorate uh, turn up. Because if they do that, then in principle, the candidate of the PT should win. Now, long-term trends, which is my last point. <clears throat> uh, I think I believe in the future of democracy. Uh, because uh, one, you have a spread of education. Uh, for the first time in the history of mankind, you have programs and policies of universal education. I mean, with UNESCO, I worked for UNESCO for 10 years. Our mandate at UNESCO is education for all throughout life, starting with primary education, secondary education, university education. And education is spreading. And as you spread education, you spread knowledge, you spread uh, uh, tolerance, you spread uh, understanding of uh, values, then because it is in the interest of the people to have democratic system, I believe therefore that as <clears throat> we spread education and we continue to educate people throughout uh, their, their life, democracy uh, will uh, prosper, irrespective of the form, of course, Democratic forms will change over time, over history, uh, in different regions of the world. It will be different. There is not one single model that uh, suits everybody. But the people in their different countries, through their different struggles, will invent models where they can participate in the decision making and they can remove leaders who don't uh, meet their uh, expectations. The second thing I, 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 I would like to see is global solidarity. I think we are in a need of a new progressive international movement. The Socialist International, unfortunately, uh, is, is, is a shadow uh, of what it used uh, to be. Today, we need really a global movement which brings together the trade unions, the youth organizations, women organizations, progressive political parties, uh, uh, universities together in order to, to think through, exchange experience, work in solidarity to make sure that the promises contained in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights will become a reality. Thank you very much. Bem, uh, a minha intenção, a intenção original. Intention, original intention was to continue, but I feel a lot of people are getting up for. I'm going to let's not take a break for everybody to be chatting outside let's have a, a five minute break ten minutes maximum so the basic human needs are met and we can come right back but before that before that and without wanting to summarize there's such important teachings that import that Pierre Sané has brought us and even for our party in one way speaking as a member of the workers party some of Pierre Sané's ideas are extremely important I want to just to make two remarks related to what he said number one looking at the public here we know that in spite of everything that we have done we have a long uh, path ahead in terms of racial and gender equality but I think racial equality even more the other one, very important, is Pierre Sané with the authority of somebody who was the General Secretary of Amnesty International, uh, drew attention to the compulsory nature 
the obligatory nature of the Committee of Human Rights of the United Nations. Unlike what has been said, is not a little committee, it's the, the treaty body of the political and civil rights uh, treaty for the observance of this treaty. It's much more important than the General Assembly. It's the body that oversees the implementation of the civil and political rights treaty. So it saddens us, this disregard that has been lent to the to the committee here in Brazil, not just as a member of the party, uh, but as a citizen, as a, a civil servant for 50 years who talked about the universality of democracy, the universality of human rights, a former general secretary of the Amnesty International reminding us of the importance of the Committee of Human Rights and the political and civil rights treaty, which the Brazilian state, not just the government, the Brazilian state is disrespecting, that will affect negatively our credibility. People who are my age remember how the dictatorship affected Brazil's image abroad for a couple of decades. So this is a shadow that has been cast over us. So thank you, uh, Piazzane, for your humanist uh, insights. Uh, Jose Luis Rodriguez Zapatero has arrived. Noam Chomsky is, is almost here too. So they will join us in the afternoon, which I won't be moderating. So I want a five-minute break. So Jorge Tayano and Malena Shahi will speak after the break. But let's take a brief break now. Thank you very much. So I would like to remind you that we're going to have very little time for uh, our debate. But, you know, uh, we can use the topics that were raised in this morning to talk uh, in the afternoon. I mean, they are interconnected. I don't think that this is really going to be a problem. We are going to still have a day full of discussions, very rich in terms of information and analysis. So I'm going to turn the floor to Marilena Shawi to start the morning, uh, to continue with the morning discussion. I'll just wait one or two minutes so that uh, her talk is not too much disrupted by people who are coming in, but, well. I explained to Celso that I shouldn't be in a panel of multilateralism because I don't understand a thing about multilateralism. However, he told me that it is this related to advocacy to democracy and st stressing out dangers for democracy. And this is, well, then I'm cool. This is what I know about. So we all know Brazil is going through times uh, that are not uh, only dark, but they are tragic. Uh, they're way over dramatic. And there are several ways of this to show. One of them is by means of deinstitutionalizing our republic and dismantling our democracy. And this happens under a clear or disguised dominance of political economy. For us to understand what is going on in Brazil today, from the perspective of the way the Brazilian politics and society are structured and not from the point of view of the Brazilian struggles uh, throughout time, I think it would be very interesting to establish a difference between what an institution is and what an organization is. What is an institution? An institution, a social institution, is a social action. It is a social practice that is founded on the public recognition of its legitimacy and its attributions in a principle of differentiation that enables 
this institution to relate to other institutions whilst keeping its autonomy. So an institution is, is structured by its internal norms and rules, standards, values of recognition and of legitimacy. And these can be internal and external to an institution. Traditionally, a society comprises a multiplicity and heterogeneity of a network of institutions. That is what a society is. Now, what is the difference between institution and organization? What is an organization? An organization differs from a social institution because an organization is defined by a different practice. Organization is defined by its instrumentals. It refers to a set of particular means to attain a particular objective. It is not like the institution related to articulated actions, to ideas of internal and external recognition, internal and external legitimacy. It is rather connected to the idea of operation, that is. It is developed by means that are used to get to a particular objective. It is, therefore, a system in which what rules are ideas of management, planning, predictability, control, and success. The mark of the institution is based on the network established with others, seeking continuous recognition and legitimacy. This is an open time. Institution is always historical. The mark of organization is that it operates in a predetermined time and space and at the limited time and space. It is ephemeris. It is not related to the time of history. It performs an operation, and once it is ended, it finishes, and then a new operation is proposed with no connection to the other. Institution, therefore, is a place for relationship and continuity of actions. An operation is a place of fragmentation, particularization, non-relation, and ephemeral. Neoliberalism operates in the level of organization by destroying institutions and that is why we are seeing the deinstitutionalization of Brazil. It operates by destroying institutions and replacing institutions with organizations. But there is a peculiarity about neoliberalism. It, it is not a historical mutation of capitalism from economic hegemony of productive capital to financial capital. Now, liberalism is a mutation that is social political, and I'm going to call it the new way of totalitarianism. And why is that? Because what characterizes totalitarianism is not the autocratic leader as Hollywood loves to show. What characterizes totalitarianism is not the presence of nationalism, racism. These are all effects that are surrounding totalitarianism. What characterizes totalitarianism is that it turns all social institutions into a single homogeneous institution. It homogenizes society as a whole. 
it becomes therefore internally undifferentiated. It totalizes society as a whole. And how does neoliberalism totalizes contemporary society as a whole? By means of a certain type of organization. And this organization is the company, the corporation. So the school is a corporation, the cultural center is a corporation, the hospital is a corporation, culture is a corporation, and clearly the state has to be a corporation. So what we have, therefore, is blocking internal differentiation of institutions, practices to which they come true whether in conflict or in harmony, in recognition or in non-recognition. Therefore, what is fundamental for democracy to exist is the need and legitimacy of difference and conflict. And this is erased under homogeneity of society, of politics, as corporations, from institution to organization. And in this case, organization that is totalitarian because the whole of society, the whole of politics are thought of as corporations. And that also shows not only at the level of institutions, but rather when a new ideology surges and it is quite peculiar and that will help us why hatred appears why resentment appears, why fear appears, which is the figure of an individual as a primary and final reality. There are no social groups, no social associations. There is an individual, and the individual is the entrepreneur of themselves. And this is what I call the neo-Calvinism, that is, the individual cast as an entrepreneur of themselves, meant as any company to have a mortal combat in all organizations, and therefore mastering the universal principle of competition, mortal combat, which is disguised under the name of meritocracy. So neo-Calvinism is disguised. I call it neo-Calvinism because that's how it was at first. And I call it neo-Calvinism because you have this figure of uh, an individual as uh, the entrepreneur of themselves. And then as a consequence of that, as from the perspective of individuals, the way that behave in the social media. Why do you have post-truth? Why do you have uh, fake news? Why do you have what we have in the social media? What happens? And what are the consequences of this individualism, uh, being the entrepreneur of yourself in human capital? On the one hand, you have narcissistic subjectivity and therefore prone to what is typical of uh, narcissism, which is depression. And then on the other hand, guilt in those that do not win competitions. Uh, the, uh, then triggering hatred against everyone, against immigrants, against migrants, against uh, unionized uh, members, the black women, indigenous populations, uh, the poor, the LGBT, and the list goes on and go on. But this is not where hatred starts. This is an effect of what happened. We believe this is the cause. No, it's not the cause. It is the effect of an organizational structure of society and of politics. This is what happening. That what is happening in Brazil. So what we have is something that destroys the perception of the self as a member, as part of a larger group, a larger class, 
a larger set and therefore destroying all the possible forms of solidarity. It's not by chance, therefore, that we are going to see a process of deterioration of democracy. And why is that? Because politically, the consequence of going from institution to organization means that the state is no longer a public institution ruled by the principles and values of democracy and Republican values. It's considered a corporation. And therefore, there is a shrinking of the public space of republic, of democracy, and an enlargement of the private space of the market of interest. And politics becomes a technical administrative issue that should be in the hands of experts. Therefore, governors that are administrators that call themselves managers. The neoliberal politics is the decision, as Chico Oliveira mentioned, of allocating public funds to investments of capital and cutting investments allocated to civil social investments. And that explains why neoliberal policy is defined by the elimination of economic, social, and political rights. This is what uh, President Temer did, the elimination of social, economic, and social political rights that are guaranteed by the public power to the benefit of private interests, turning rights into services defined by the rationale of the market. That is, privatization of rights that are turned into services that are purchased or sold in the market. And with that, you increase all forms of inequality, injustice, and exclusion. Therefore, what is going on in terms of politics in Brazil today corrodes and destroys the heart of democracy. It staggers not only republic, but democracy as well, because it destroys the two key elements of democracy, conflict and the creation of rights. So what are the consequences of that to us, and I think to the world and to others, you know, let alone, you just have to listen to President Trump speaking. But anyway, the first is the end of social democracy with privatization of rights. The second is the end of representative democracy. That is, when politics is seen as management, it is no longer a practice through which individuals come from society, chosen by society, have the competence to discuss the future of the society. This politics, which is the nucleus of the idea of representation, is extinguished because politics is thought of as management. And if it's management, then the figure of the parliament, for instance, loses its meaning. It becomes something smaller, whose function is basically to inspect the interests of one and the others. But the role of legislation, as it should be in a democratic republic, disappears or is about to disappear in Brazil. And as a consequence of that, I would like to say that the judicialization of politics, which we have been discussing for some time now, is something that we consider as in the past as the cause of something, that judicialization would produce things. No, judicialization is the effect of a new liberal conception of 
politics. If politics is thought of as a corporation, as a game of private interests, how do you solve problems in the business world amongst corporations, be it inside the corporation or in between corporations? You go to the judiciary power. This is the world. This is the world of economic interest. You settle all your problems in two ways only. Either by war, you kill your opponent, or by means of the judicial system. So the judicialization we see in Brazil is not just a crazy thing that is in the minds of a few. It is not something that is demoralizing. It's not. It is the way the new liberal politics work. Judicializing is to do what? To neutralizing any possibility of giving a voice, legitimacy to conflict, and let it unfold in society. And it is why elections are the way they are today. It, they have become a problem. They have become a problem because they did not expect, after everything that was done, that there would still be some political vigor in Brazilian society. And this vigor that is expected to come from the left, that is complete chaos because the pathway has been settled for this not to happen. Why am I saying that? Because we should not believe in historical inexorable laws. We shouldn't believe in fate. And we shouldn't believe in divine providence. We have the power to change things. And this is proof of that. And just to close, Amorim, now you're doing fine. <laughs> I would like to say something about multilateralism, because it's kind of indecent to be in this panel of multilateralism. Don't say anything about that. So I'm going to say something, probably something wrong, because I'm not an expert. But anyway, I'm going to say something, because, you know, I think that we are watching the end of multilateralism as a consequence of this new way that was taken by imperialism. First, we went from a bipolar world to a multipolar world, globalization. And now we are going towards a new imperialism. And why is it new imperialism? Well, first, because the paradigm of this imperialism is no longer the productive uh, capital, because that demands an occupation of territories at the level of infrastructure itself. It has as paradigm the financial capital that needs no infrastructure at all. So how does the new imperialism operate? Uh, new imperialism that destroys multilateralism. It's no longer the political economic occupation of a country operating at the level of its infrastructure, of its state and its ideology. It now operates as an occupation. It is an organization, so it occupies a delimited territory by a delimited time to explore this territory. It needs not an entire country. It needs no military occupation in this country. It does need a political occupation of this country. It does need, need a religious, cultural, uh, ideological occupation of this country, as the old imperialism did. It just delimits a portion of this territory and occupies it. And it occupies it by means of its corporations. It can be military occupation, but generally it is a after 
but at by the limited time. And after you exploit it all, you just go away. Like a financial bubble, it goes away and leaves whatever is left there. And it's interesting that this procedure, uh, the way of operation of the new liberalism has a name, and it is called operation. And that's why there are so many operations in Brazil, all kinds of operations. Just to be clear that they have a limited time, a limited objective, and by the end of this time and objective, the operation is over. It does not form a history. It just delimits its efficacy, its success, or its failure. And it is this, the neoliberal model of society, politics, and thinking. And the way that we see the operation of justice and of so many operations in Brazil, so what we have here, we have deinstitutionalization that I talked about, the deinstitutionalization of the public, the destruction of uh, democracy, and the imperialistic exploitation with the pre-salt, with Embraer, what is going on in the Amazon. And this neo-imperialism explains why the United States do not have to have a plan for the world. Because the world was something that was of interest of the old imperialism. The new imperialism is a one-off operation. And Trump only needs to keep the power of the US. But uh, he, does, he no longer needs to invade any other countries because he has local operations that will do the job for him and will abduct the countries that are in the outskirts of the global realm. This is us, but we'll fight. Thank you. Thanks, Marilena. I think, you know, the applause says more than any comment I can have. But I would like to say something that has a little to do with what we talked about, the media and the post-truth. In addition to occupying the whole or part of a territory, the imperialism occupies the minds of people. And this is one of the aspects we can discuss later on in this debate of over the way of thinking and single thinking. OK, very well then. Now I'm going to turn the floor to George Tayana. And with him, we are going to conclude our morning session. And let's see if we have room for debate later on. Thank you, Celso. Thank you to the Foundation and all of you for this opportunity. This is uh, an opportune debate. And furthermore, it is necessary. Many things have already been mentioned that I agree with much of what has been said so far. Regarding multilateralism and the crisis, I am not convinced that after the fall of the wall we had a stage of multilateralism. And if we did have an attempt, this I uh, had this idea of reordering the world and the UN system. You remember, in 1992, we had the Rio conference in 93 Vienna about human rights, 94 uh, populations in Cairo, 95 the women's conference in Beijing. But all this effort to generate a multilateral space that had much to do with the Clinton government in the United States, in fact, failed or was uh, bricked. And that was in 2001, not in the Twin Towers attempt, but three days before when 
the, race anti, the racism and xenophobia conference ended in Durban. You remember that the conference terminated, ended in, in uh, failure, which cost Mary Robinson her job in the High Commissioner's office. There was no agreement developing countries, particularly African and Arab countries, could not agree with developed countries. There was a rupture, in other words, of a certain agreement that had been worked on since 1989, since the fall of the wall. And this led us to, to what led us to what we know well, unilateralism with the second Iraq war, which was the highest example of this unilateralism. And I believe there were many attempts to save, to salvage this uh, to attempt to reorganize the, the world. And BRICS was an attempt. And G20, after the 2008 crisis, was also an effort to try to reorder. But they did not manage to change particularly the financialization, which is the key factor of the 2008 crisis, did not manage to change the rules of the game of the financial system, of the multilateral financial system, the IMF and the World Bank. But they weren't able either to put the brakes on financial speculation and tax, haven, tax havens. I think financialization as the axis, the dominant axis since 2008 is the proof that in some way the consolidation of the loss of multilateralism as a tool to solve conflicts and the possibility of having a world of of equals, of more equals, with a certain amount of flexibility in the search for consensus. Of course, they they were never fully equals because of the permanent members of the Security Council, etc. But anyway, this political process is now followed up not just by the financialization and the revolution of the media. And that is only one dimension of the process, because behind the process, there is a revolution, a technological revolution, a production revolution that that started beforehand. I remember the technotronic discussion, and somebody said that, that the, United, the Soviet Union was going to fall uh, with the technotronic revolution, but uh, nobody believed at the time. But you know, the way power is accumulated and distributed uh, in the first stage, concentrated power in the developed countries, ending up with this this north-south dialogue before the fall of the wall and giving to the owners of this major revolution an enormous advantage and a basis to propel forward neoliberalism. And so if the United States makes phones, we have to buy them from the United States, otherwise we won't be able to speak on the phone, right? So what is contradictory is that this technology is so concentrated, but at the same time it disseminates very quickly and is very quickly appropriated by other countries. It's, for example, Chinese development is inexplicable, and the fact that it is more advanced in artificial intelligence than the United States today and that's the major problem that Trump has to confront. It could not be explained without this capacity of disseminate that new technologies have. This is a comment about multilateralism, but I want to come to the region and to Brazil. In the region, for over 30 years, we've been in transition to democracy, leaving behind the dictatorships, and so now we have this transition to democracy in Latin America, which is what has been taking place in the last three decades in Brazil. This transition and the region. This transition to democracy was accompanied by what was called the modernization, economic modernization, processes of economic modernization. And they seemed similar to each other and linked because there were 
limits to be placed on the state, so a democratic transition to limit the power of the armed forces to intervene in private uh, lives, in individual freedoms and liberties. So the state was lacking in prestige, so it uh, limits on the economic uh, intervention of the state at the same time. So these processes had different consequences for the region, differently from what happened in Argentina, Chile, and Brazil was all a little different. But, but at the end of the 20th century, at the start of the current century, there was a reaction to this, to these processes both at the political level and the economic level. In the political level, what is interesting about this reaction when it came about, so the people's movements, their left, progressive, some people call them populists, whatever you want to call them, these movements had three characteristics. Firstly, they were not satisfied with the democra democracy that was actually existing in the countries. They sought a more participative democracy and not just traditional liberal representative democracy. Second, they were not satisfied with the results of neoliberalism, particularly the weakening of the state, the loss of domestic markets, very often with indiscriminate uh, openings to foreign uh, trade and privatizations, and also with the control of their territory. In these years, the region saw the increase uh, our activities of of criminal activities not, uh, drug trade human trafficking etc and loss of control over the ter territory and this reaction led to many uh, leaderships emerging chavez was the first to win and the most transcendental was when lula in brazil was elected in 2002 as well as having a critical view of the actually existing economy and society there was a, a, a partial consensus about the remedy because differently from the past when you there was an appeal to the military there was on the agenda the idea that the problems of democracy could be solved with more democracy and for the economy let's build the domestic market jobs a certain control of the state over certain economic sectors and an element a common element to all was that in this globalized world the integration among equals was a very important element so this was what strengthened the mercosul uh, led to the creation of unasur uh, creation of CELAC, the community of Latin American and Caribbean states. And there was this idea that we would not follow the United States lead for the free trade area of the Americas. This took place before uh, reactions in other parts of the world and critiques, because the process of democratic opening is not a privilege of Latin America. It took place all over after the fall of the Berlin Wall, for example, in Eastern Europe. And there was no critical vision there for many years because the incorporation to the European Union gave them many uh, advantages. It happened partially in, in Asia and Africa as well. So, very well. I need to be brief. I believe that starting in the 2008 crisis, the situation, the strategic situation changes. So the process of change in our region and the situation all over the world begins to uh, exist. A critique to liberal of liberal democracy, this is very uh, noticeable in Eastern Europe, for instance. And a fact takes place that we did not expect when the 2008 crisis came about. What did we think? Now other countries will notice that we were right that our critiques of the lack of regulation of control uh, we thought that you know maybe what role the g20 might play that this might strengthen the BRICS group but that did not take place of course in greece it seemed that it could happen but what actually emerged let's say this clearly were new forms of fascism in many countries that took the lead and took on this idea of being the bearers of change. And this is what happened, started happening. This started happening also in our own regions. Like, uh, 
uh, conservative sectors that were in favor of, let's say, of a restoration, quote unquote, that had been on the margins because they had not, they didn't have the votes, but they had economic power and they had the media, the more concentrated media in the world here in Latin America. But they were on the retreat, so they started coming out of the woodwork once again with this idea of growth with the people's government that l that was starting losing steam because of the international economic crisis the fall in commodity prices because certain objectives had been met and they were not able to go beyond for a number of reasons these democ people's democracies were losing their freshness, losing their vitality, and this space was being opened up to these restoration, uh, conservative restoration uh, forces. So a part of the judiciary, let's not call it the justice system because it's very different. Let's call it the judiciary playing an active role in this restoration, quote unquote. And this is what we are experiencing. I want to underline something which is well known but it's worth reminding ourselves the merit of these governments of the Lula government was that we reduced inequality we don't didn't just rescue people from poverty we reduced inequality with two remarks we did this in the continent which is the most the region of the world which is the most unequal in the world which is Latin America and in a world where a technological change and financialization and appropriation of capital were increasing, were enhancing inequality in other countries. So we were a phenomenon that was atypical here in Latin America. And within that, we have the United States that are the major power in the world still, obviously the, the most important power in the hemisphere. And in, in fact, during much of these, the duration of these people's governments, they had the priorities in other regions and, uh, and against so-called international terrorism, etc. So we had this room for maneuver uh, that was greater than in the past to develop ourselves. And since 2013, the United States have been saying that this is no longer our pri their priority, international terrorism. They're now looking to China, which is, the ma which is a major economic partner, uh, financial trade partner, uh, infrastructure partner of many countries in, this, in, in our region, and a source of, of financial instruments such as uh, swaps. So the development of all that challenges the importance of the traditional financial uh, bodies like the IMF, the World Bank. And it seems to me that in the last four years or so, what we're witnessing is an effort by the United States in alliance with conservative sectors of the country to restore an order, a different order, and recover privileges and to return from the strategic point of view to having their backyard here in Latin America as their own. This is what we're experiencing right now, specifically what is happening, particularly in Brazil, draws our attention and uh, puts the, the raises the challenge that we're having that the democracy is at stake here, yes. The rule of law is at stake, yes. This has implications for the whole country, obviously, yes. But even worse, what is at play, what is at stake is not simply democracy. What is at stake is the possibility that there be governments that through reforms, through the path of reforms and participation and the building of major social majorities that they can change the power relations and generate more democracy, economic democracy for the region. And so is therefore very serious this incarceration of Lula. And it's very serious what is happening in Brazil because what is at stake uh, uh, is very important. Look at what is happening in Argentina. We lost at the ballot box, but everything else we lost is similar. The judicial um, persecution, the loss of rights, 
we're spending money on public safety instead of education, and the discourse is the same. The philosophical uh, grounding is the same. In Argentina, since the emergence of Peron, all the last seven, the, 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 the thinking of the last 70 years has to be thrown into the, into the dustbin. So to what extent in the region, through political participation, democratic participation of the majorities, the masses of the population, to produce changes that lead us to societies that have more rights, more equality, or at least less inequality, and more justice, more freedom. And this is what some are willing to not recognize. So I want to conclude with a sentence, a very quick sentence, brief sentence, the Human Rights Committee resolution was mentioned here. What about fake news? We don't need to look them up in the in the in our cell phones. They are in the editorials of the mainstream media. In the La Nacion newspaper, for example, the editorial said in my country, Brazil A decision of the Human Rights Committee said that Lula should be free. The committee doesn't exist. It was replaced by the Council of Human Rights as if the committee was the Council. How are you going to listen to something that doesn't exist? This is a lie. This is a bold-faced lie, and it's a shame. It's shameful, and it's not a a piece that is signed. It's the editorial. It's as if uh, General Mitri himself was writing. So, as was said, neoliberalism has an important problem to explain part of the crisis of multilateralism and the emergence of the ultra-right movements in Europe. Part of what we have done was to try to defend the welfare state, a state that was created in the context of the Cold War. And with the end of the Cold War, the powerful believed that they would be able to dilute or eliminate gradually this welfare state. And let us not be fooled, liberal democracy was sustained through the welfare state. It's very hard that a liberal democracy can subsist if there isn't at least a welfare state that brings balance between conflicts in the economic field and the social field. That's it from me. Thank you very much. Well, one last remark. Lula Livre. Free Lula. Okay, very well. As nobody here from my staff told me to stop, I'm going to open up for, let's say, four comments. Let's not go beyond uh, three minutes, otherwise there won't be any time. But first, I want to make one remark myself without wanting to uh, summarize so many important ideas. but returning to a concept that was mentioned at the beginning about the geopolitics of democracy and in certain way taken up again in other interventions. I think it's very important to be clear about this. We are experiencing, depend, uh, we, we are in the Americas, okay, the American continent, and it is intolerable for the hegemonic power that there should be rivalries emerging within this continent, this area. Somebody was remi 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 reminding me, America for Americans, Car Carlos Ominami was talking about yesterday. I think it was Tayana that was talking about this, about Saint Spania, uh, Argentinian. Thinker. Anyway, it's intolerable for them. So there are two things that made it impossible to sustain this, because democracy here, with its 
people's characteristic, pro-people characteristic of defending the interest of the humble, to use Pierre Sanet's uh, uh, expression. It was leading to the appropriation of our resources by ourselves. This issue of resources was also raised here. Number two, with the integration, first of South America, fut in future of Latin America and the Caribbean, creating actually uh, a counterweight. I, I often say, I've said this in many talks with different uh, audience than here, I remember two uh, covers of The Economist magazine. One is well known, which is the idea of the Christ the Redeemer statue in Rio as if it were a rocket taking off. And the other one, more important, showed the American continent on its on its head, in other words, upside down. The convention is uh, there's no truth. There are Italian maps of the starting of the sixteenth century that show the the, the 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 south at the top. But anyway, the convention is the north at the top. So the map showing uh, the American economist, ups the American continent, upside down, and the title of the Economist was "No Longer Anyone's Backyard." So the idea that South America, Latin America, ceased to be someone's backyard, and that democracy is inevitably leading to this break of paradigm, meant that imperialism here, defined by Marielena Shawi to come together with the elites, e egotistical, individualistic, to not say corrupt, let's say uh, self-serving, let's say, came together with this imperial uh, interest and led to this regression sometimes by the ballot box under the influence of the economic powers or through parliamentary coups. If we're not careful, it will happen again. Of course, it's important to win elections. I'm not going to make any specific publicity here with progressive. We have a progressive candidate. So ideas of independence, integration, and social justice. But let us not be fooled. We had these illusions to a certain extent, Georgie because the power of the hemisphere was so busy in the Middle East, they left a little breach for us that was relatively free, that after 2008, they said, oops, no, that room for maneuver you no longer have. So the pre-salt oil fines, the bricks, uh, uh, led to this new attitude. OK, so I'm going to open up for four contributions from the floor. So Mino Carta, who uh, won't come in the afternoon, uh, has asked to, to, to speak. I'll be brief. And I talk about journalists, but also a citizen. I think it is important that our guests understand what Brazil is exactly. In my understanding, you know, the big house and the slavery quarters ex still exist in Brazil. And we have to consider that uh, this is a country in which we have 64,000 uh, people murdered last year. Almost 50% of the Brazilian territory is not reached by basic sanitation. For you to understand, contradicting what Villapin mentioned, and uh, of course he deserves all my respect, the French Revolution never came to Brazil. The ideas of Illuminism never got to Brazil. We are a country in certain aspects that is really, really behind. So all that said, I think the coup was a failure, the coup of 2016. If they allowed elections to take place, uh, they did that because they thought they were going to win. I mean, it seems clear to me. In fact, the end objective of the coup was 
to remove Lula forever from this election. And the objective uh, was achieved. I mean, there is no discussion about that. Lula is out. But still, they are not winning. In fact, the presence of Lula on top of all polls till today, uh, we know that he would possibly win in the first round. I mean, that shows that behind something there is a mute popular resistance, but that is true, that is undeniable, it's strong. This is the positive side of the story. The coup failed completely. It was a total disaster. The coup after two years is failure. What I fear is what to come next. If a progressive candidate wins, be it uh, Haddad or Ciro, I don't know, I think we run serious risks. Uh, the interview of General Villaboas to newspaper O Estado last Sunday is quite serious. I confess, I would love Adadi to have said what Ciro Gomes said. A general that makes this kind of statement, a commander of the army, that says such things in a civilized democratic world should be arrested. Adad didn't say that. I always fear this expectation of concessions to the big house or to the status quo, whatever you say. Uh, inside uh, PT, itself, there are people that believe in the reconciliation of the elite. No member of PT will ever step foot in the big house. Thank you. Palhar, as you had asked uh, the floor. First, we had someone from Carta Capital Magazine, and now for Carta Maior. But I'm not speaking on behalf of Carta Maior, OK? I uh, just submit to my leader that is Mino Carta. I speak on behalf of Forum Tuntuan. I am the political secretary. I have the authorization of President Padilla. And I would like to use such uh, illustrious presence of our candidates uh, to ask you to take to your countries the idea that we have to create an independent news agency at the global level so that uh, our stories are not distorted by Reuters and other international agencies. Our coup is led by global communications. And we do not have enough strength to face them. And this is the example that you gave to the world the magnificent work that Celso developed with his team unveiled what was happening in the country and prevented somehow for many of the misunderstanding to be cleared. So please think of the possibility of creating a body, a virtual body, that can be turned into an independent international news agency. Thank you very much. Fernando Pacheco, democratically, has signed up to talk. Well, I'm Fernando Pacheco. I'm an economist. I would like to uh, 
talk about what Charles Tayana said about how the crisis started, the point that the crisis started, and embellishing the multilateral world. We had the invasion of Iraq and then Afghanistan, and even Syria can be located in this point of time. So we have the main partner of the multilateral system disrespecting multilateralism, which caused the problem. And parallel to that, we have as, uh, movements that were well led by Celso, by external policies that were successful, but without the support of the main member, the continuity of these actions were limited. And here we had the opportunity to hear leaders that were in very important position at this point in time and that experienced this relationship with the United States from multiple perspectives. And I would like to hear your opinion. How do you diagnose what was the relationship that this country has had with the US in the past 10 years? And what is the perspective now after the victory of Trump and after the emergence of new movements in the United States that are criticizing the place the country occupied in the world? And also, uh, another part of this question, perhaps Brazilians will be able to answer answered this question better than our uh, invited guests. Brazil is a country that has a presence of international agencies inside Brazil from the UN and everyone, but at the same time, uh, the Brazil denied the roles of uh, the Human Rights Committee of uh, the United Nations. How are we going to approach the international bodies if the country does not respect its rules? I have two more, Paul de Lastre and then Su Heng Chin, and then we are going to stop with the, uh, the contributions from the audience. Good afternoon. Uh, first, congratulations on the event. I am professor of the University of uh, Rio de Janeiro. I have two uh, quick statements and then a question for the panel. First, uh, uh, you know, we are Latin Americans going through a dramatic time. Uh, we talked about the weakening of multilateralism, even inside the region. Uh, Nasalax almost forgotten things that are so important that uh, at the time of our external foreign policy and a retrocess in the region, not only by increasing the poverty levels, but also a decrease of the protestant parties. Perhaps there's even a sign of hope with the possibility of return in Brazil, but also the victory of Labrador in Mexico, which is a sign that maybe we can have a thread of hope. The second comment is thinking about the world and the contemporary scenario. Perhaps what we are seeing is uh, going back to the idea of a traditional geopolitical world. Villepin talked about in Europe, Hungary building walls, Poland with a completely xenophobic uh, a government. Marilena talked about that. So going back to that restricted area of establishing borders, uh, shrinking the idea of globalization. And perhaps that may be a problem even for Europe. And a question, something that I think you haven't approached. When we look back a few years ago, there was the rebirth of a new way of democracy. Uh, movements uh, uh, out in the world. We saw it in Africa, in Tunis, Egypt, Brazil in 2013. People taking on the streets, Spain, President Zapatero is here. So all that coming post the 2008-2009 economic crisis. It's difficult today, a few years, to really know in practical results what happened. What happened to the people taking the streets? Perhaps Professor Marilena can say something about that. OK, thank you very much. So Heng Chino. Good morning, everyone. I think it was a very rich debate. Can you introduce yourself? Perhaps no one, uh, not everyone knows you. I'm Walter Sorrentin. I'm vice president of the Communist Party in Brazil and uh, international relations uh, secretary. 
The first panel was very rich because from different perspectives, we could see a huge convergence, which is very important to make us Brazilians, as Celso said, incorporate to our political doing this view from outside in. Because Brazil is an important player in the international scenario, especially in Latin America. So the first comment I have is that this convergence is starts from a late crisis of neoliberalism, which expresses those last 10 years of capitalistic crisis. It is also a crisis of neoliberal globalization with protectionism, commercial wars, unilateral reaction from the US. But it's also, and I think that we haven't mentioned that much because it was not the central topic of the panel, the rebirth of a new international order, an order of uh, no longer progressive shared uh, globalization. And these three comments have to do with the main consequence that I think was well approached by everyone. It is democracy that suffers the most in this time. Uh, political democracy and social democracy. More than threats to democracy, we are experiencing a crisis of democracy. That is a result of all these factors and contradictions. And therefore, um, I have some questions that perhaps you can answer. In Brazil, we now have a new social, political, economic order under the habitation and at the margin of the state of law. It is a new order that is built at the margin of our constitution. Brazil has a particularity. Um, we cannot talk much about that, but uh, there are lots of vanguard experiences that had an impact in the world, good and bad, that started in Brazil. And perhaps now we are in one more avant-garde example in times of conservatives offensive. Mariana, Marilena talked a bit about that, about uh, the kinds of habitation we are having now. That is uh, the judicialization of power. We have a judge in the Supreme Court saying that power of the 20th uh, center is the judicial power. In the 19th century, it was the empire. And in the 20th century, it was the parliament. So we are before a judicialization. I'm sorry, the pleonasm, Marilena. A judicialization that is institutionalized of arbitration. And that may be a great danger which is the danger of democracy throughout the world. And then I would ask you how this is taking place in your countries. Is that a trend? Is that something that is happening not only in Brazil, but everywhere else? It seems to me that the pace has left the toothpaste tube. Uh, the role of the judicial power is completely anomalous uh, today in Brazil, if you think of balance of powers. I don't know if it's a cause or a consequence, as Marilena has to do, but it has to do with the emptying of democracy, the emptying of Congress power in our country. And I would end by saying this is very important based on what Diana said. If you think of the political consequences of that, which is what really matters to us, especially in Latin America, he is completely right. This effort in Brazil is articulated as it was in the coup of 64 to the attempt of vetoing an institutional future to get to power from progressive popular fronts. I think this is the greatest imperialistic offensive that is posing above us. And I think this is quite clear in Latin America. Thank you very much. Well, I have to give uh, our panelists a little opportunity to talk. Uh, very, very briefly, each one of them. We are not going to be able to answer all questions and, all, and comments on all um, comments made, 
but I'm going to very briefly start with Tayana, right? You can each say a little, little thing about uh, uh, the audience, and I'm going to end uh, uh, with my final comments. Well, I have two comments. First, what uh, seems clear to me is that we have to define uh, the region as a territory that is in dispute. And the dispute about the possibility, the visibility of democratic, progressive governments of uh, taking power and uh, proceeding with change. Um, uh, um, I haven't talked about many things. There are many topics to talk about that. But we have this dispute, and uh, it has to do then with elections that will define where we're going to if we continue with the degradation of democracy and the state of law, or if we're able to recover ourselves from this wrong pathway to follow. And then the multilateralism of the region. Yes, people are not interested in that. They have a different kind of rationale. And in terms of movement, well, I think that there's still some things to happen. We believe that uh, popular forces and organizations should be aware of this fact. But undoubtedly, in these processes, uh, our region um, uh, has uh, um, to go through a basis of development. One point about uh, multilateralism. It seems to me that it's very important to understand that the crisis we are going through is very much due to the fact that we are in a process that was not completed, in which uh, lateralism continues to lighten up the world. Unilateralism is certainly due to the position of domination of the United States, and we see that in the increased uh, um, military interventions of the U.S., first uh, in Iraq and then Libya, the situation in Syria and in so many countries. And this situation contributed or led to many of the democracies in the world to think that uh, open crisis like uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan could only be addressed by means of military intervention. And that was a historical error of George Bush. Because without a political strategy, without a political initiative, without the capacity of a political leadership, you do not solve a crisis. And the consequences of that is the suicide that we saw of uh, those governments, uh, those immigrations, millions of people that are migrating their countries. And this is of utmost importance. Of course, we also have to measure the consequences of unilateralism in economy. But what seems to me very important is the incapacity of the international society to work together to reform institutions and the capacity of operating in the international scenario. The United Nations didn't succeed in anything. Kofi Annan that uh, worked very hard with this objective in 2006 when we think that the United States has no representatives at the level of the permanent members of the Security Council or Africa or Latin America. How is it possible to be effective if you do not have legitimacy in, I don't know, the Security Council? That is the agency that is going to act amidst a crisis. And I'm going to close with one thing that I think can be a perspective of hope. So China invented a new concept, which is the diplomacy of projects. So 
to put countries to work in different countries, one objective, which is the development of Eurasia, Eurasia with a global project, which is to develop the infrastructure in the less developed countries in the Caucasus and Central Europe, and Central Asia, rather, to prevent Islamic terrorism using all the cultural, political, strategic means for Europe to work with Russia, to work with China. We are now faced uh, facing a world where it's very hard, almost impossible to work with the United States at least living in a country where we get organized with China, with Russia, with Europe, all the emerging countries to be able to develop examples of solidarity and diplom the diplomacy of projects. There's one major project which at the European level. So why doesn't European Union do what China is doing with relation to Eurasia? Why doesn't Europe do it in relation to Africa to develop the perspectives of Africa. So for now, we look at Africa, we see problems, terrorist problems, immigration problems, bad governments. That is a historic mistake on the part of Europe when looking at, at Africa. To have a major project with Africa is necessary. And how can we not think about the relationship of the United States, North America with South America also should have the possibility of having this kind of diplomacy. When you look at the problems of infrastructure in Latin America, the hard it is to go from, from Peru to Argentina, from Bolivia to Rio, the pers prospects for working in common with a vision, a historical vision, this could lend meaning and interest for multilateralism. So let's leave aside the empty concepts and let's enter a world where daily work is done with concrete projects in mind and the people, people can see change happening. What we need most is success, is results. Europe is faced with major problems, very important problems, democracy, the separation between the elites and the peoples, and these cannot be solved without, at the end of the day, the people thinking that the interest, the general interest, the common good is something that will bring together all the forces of Europe. And that, people are ex hoping that European Union is, are, are people are looking to the European Union for that. And if in the European elections of May 2019, if we're not able to set our sights on a certain level of projects and what constitutes success, we are in dire straits. About what's happening in the world. And uh, of course, uh, from the European point of view, I think that uh, our concern is uh, even uh, greatest than the concern of our friends of Latin America. Uh, nationalism, the crisis of European project, very worrying perspective of the new European elections. Well, we, we must react, of course. But uh, we have to, to, to recognize that the crisis uh, has uh, deeply weakened democratic world, democratic left, democratic center left in Europe is so far. We, we are unable to offer a, a, a convincing and strong response. But uh, let me stress briefly, very short, some positive element, because I think uh, it's important now to, to underline, to focus on some positive element. Uh, I totally agree with uh, Dominique de Villepin about uh, the message, the initiative coming from China. Of course, uh, I also am cooperating with Chinese 
about uh, the new Silk Road. Of course, the Chinese want to expand their influence. It's a big power with a strong tradition and with uh, the idea of exert in the world a leading role. But at least the Chinese challenge is uh, peaceful, aimed at a new vision of globalization, a more harmonious globalization based on cooperation, on uh, strengthening <laughs> ties uh, between different people, cultures. And uh, I think it offers an opportunity. Uh, I totally share that Europe could do more in order to take this opportunity. And I think that uh, the American uh, reaction, protectionism, cannot, cannot stop the Chinese growth. China is back, back because in its long history was, is back one of the major power and uh, is trying to strengthen its position through a new vision of globalization. That's an opportunity. Second, it's true in Latin America in the last year, the, the progressive wave seems to be in a difficult situation, but Mexico is a great country, and what happened in Mexico is an important message. We will see, but in any case, the victory of Lopez Obrador is not exactly what the Trump administration could expect from Mexico. It's an opportunity. Brazil. I agree with my friend Mino Carta. What's, up, what's happening in Brazil is astonishing. Because after an overwhelming campaign, television, newspapers, uh, new media, Still, Lula is in the polls, the most credible political figure in Brazil. The resistance of people around the figure of Lula is incredible. That shows that the work of Brazilian progressive along many years, something <laughs> has created in the deep, society of Brazil. And uh, we will see some weak, decisive week, it's very, it's very soon, the, the elections, but what may happen in Brazil would be important for the entire world. You must be aware of that. Because Brazil is not a small country. Brazil is a big, it's the biggest country of Latin America, is a strong protagonist of the international political life. What's going to happen, maybe in your country, may represent a strong message for the entire world. Uh, I remember at the beginning Lula. I was in Brazil for the Lula campaign in 2002, and I remember how Lula uh, used to, 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 to see Europe as a model, the European Union, peaceful cooperation, a new vision of international relations. Well, it's important. Now Europe is living a difficult situation. And as European, I hope that a good message could come from Brazil. Because the victory of the progressive in Brazil, the failure of the so-called coup d'etat, would represent 
a very important message for the entire world. Well, uh, we are concerned, but keep working together. And dear comrades, we are waiting a good news from your country and the world need that. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Mrs. Tania Maria Abdo Rochel from Paraguay. Mr. Ben Achur from Tunisia. Mrs. Brandis Keris from Latvia. Mrs. Sarah Cleveland from the United States. Mr. Amin Fatala from Egypt. Mr. Olivier Fouville from France. Mr. Christophe Ains from South Africa. Mr. Iwasawa from Japan. Mrs. Ivana Jelik from Montenegro. Mr. Benjamin Koita from Mauritania. Mrs. Marcia Kran from Canada. Mr. Duncan Muhu Musa from Uganda. Mrs. Pazartsis from Greece, Mr. Maurice Politi from Italy, Mr. Jose Manuel Santos Pais from Portugal, Mr. Yuval Shani from Israel, Mrs. Margot Waterval from Suriname, Mr. Andrea Zimmerman from Germany. These are the members of the United Nations Human Rights Committee that has taken the decision concerning the case that was submitted to them by Brazil. They are elected every four years. They are individuals, experts of high morality, and the mission that has been given to them by the governments, it is not a, a, a mission that they take on themselves, is to uphold the convention that the governments have redacted and that the governments have ratified and that the governments have committed to implement. So there is no mystery. There are several committees. For each treaty, you will have a committee, a committee on racism, on women, on children, etc. There is no mystery. There is no confusion. It is clear and simple. They examine cases regularly coming from all over the world, submitted by victims. And their mission is a mission that has been given to them by governments, including Brazil. So Brazil has to play the game. Because if Brazil doesn't play the game, then the game will be spoiled. It means, therefore, that everybody will be at risk. So for dirty political play to spoil the work of the United Nations, we all rely on the United Nations bodies to protect the victims of violations of human rights. And it is unacceptable for any country, for that matter, but especially a country like Brazil that has gone through gross violation of human rights during the military dictatorship, that turns around and then becomes a champion of multilateralism of human rights of the UN system to discard an injunction that it has an obligation to follow is totally unacceptable and in sending to the world a very bad message that Brazil is not anymore a field player. Thank you. There was a question directly uh, 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 posed to me, so that's what I'll answer. So I want to begin by saying three things at a preliminary level, and then I'll go to 2013, which is my preferred focus. The first thing that I want to say is that I would like very much to be able to talk about the Egyptian demonstrations and the occupation of Wall Street, but I don't have enough information. I never delved into these matters to be able to say something um, appropriately. So 
in the case of Egypt, what I know, which is not much good, that without these cell phones, without cell phones, that, that thingamabob over there, without that thingamabob, there wouldn't have been uh, what happened there, at least not in the size that it took on, the capacity to uh, call upon people and gather people that happened at the uh, Tahrir Square. There was an initial victory. They unseated the president. Um, and then afterwards, another general president took over. OK, that's the second remark, is that I come from a tradition of the left of the 70s and 80s, which is the tradition of the importance of social movements, people's movements, social movements, and therefore the idea that you have a society that is self-organized, and it is this self-organization of society that sustains and permits changes to take place at the political plane. So, but we, we, we must have clarity. These are movements that make demands connected to needs. So the moment of politicization is the moment when you go from demands to the struggle and from the need to the right. So from the particular need to the universality of rights, that is the political leap that the social movement, the people's movement takes. And 90% of times, in the case of Brazil, is connected with the link between the movements and a political party. My third remark is that I have a deep-seated distrust of social movements in Brazil against corruption. And I'll tell you why. Brazil is the country where there is a figure that exists nowhere else in the world, which is the despachante. Despachante is the person that goes around the bureaucracy to speed up processes. And that means the co institutionalized corruption, because the corruption is part of its constitution. It's very, so you would need a revolution to undo that, because only a revolution would, this that is a formative part of our Brazilian sociability, so to speak, which is the corruption of others and of oneself for that to disappear. That is why I completely dis distrust these uh, and so-called anti-corruption movements, 90% of the time, I think that those people there uh, knocking knocking on, on pots and pans in Avenida Paulista, they're probably more corrupt than most. You can bet that they are corrupt themselves. It could be in the simple things like uh, how a, a, a person that is mean to their domestic employees they they are corrupt so don't come with that to me in brazil you can fight for 90,000 subjects but the so-called anti-corruption struggle don't don't come with that so curitiba is the is the falsehood the hypocrisy the illegitimacy of all this it's the living proof so now I'll talk about 2013, if you allow me. Can I, Amori? Yes, there's time. In 2013, look, I'll begin backwards, OK? OK, forward, let's see. To make clear the following, I have colleagues of various stripes in the humanities of the United of the University of São Paulo that started celebrating 2013 as the final moment. One of them even wrote something like that. 
where the streets would catch fire and freedom and justice and change would happen. 2013. So I'm talking about this limit, this extreme case, because it was a constant thing, because all around Brazil, people on the left, 90% not connected to the Workers' Party, said that this was a moment where the left was being reborn in Brazil and something big was going to happen. So, so from the past to the present. Now, 2013 came about in Sao Paulo. It's completely different. Now, I'm only going to talk about Sao Paulo, what happened in Rio, Black Blocks, Recife was different, Salvador was each place. There's a local story that explains what happens. Let's talk about Sao Paulo only. The demonstrations began because of the increase in the bus fare. I was, uh, uh, many people who are in this room, we were together at the meeting where the mayor called upon the, the council of the city and uh, the so-called free, free transport movement were discussing with them, we were discussing with them the the bus fare. They went there, they showed their, talked about their positions, and the council voted in favor of not rising the bus fare, not raising the bus fare. The Secretary of Transport didn't hear the advice, didn't hear the movement, and decided that he was going to increase the fare against the wishes of everyone there. What did the free transport movements say. They went to the streets to demonstrate. So one week before this meeting, I was teaching at the university, and I heard a funny noise, like a rattle, a bell, and a flute in the corridors. And I asked my students, do you know what this is? And they said, it's the free transport movement calling us for a demonstration. There were about 15, 20 of them, and they managed to bring, come together in the history department to bring together about 30 people, and they took those things, cell phones. After the meeting of the council two weeks later and the disaster that, that was, they took their phones and started disseminating and everybody went to Avenida Paulista to demonstrate. I went. When I saw, it was such a heterogeneous crowd, so I asked a, a lady, I asked her, why are you here? She seemed to be from a poor neighborhood. The owner of the house where I live raised the rent, and I can't afford it, so I came here to protest. So I walked a little bit more. I found a young woman. I asked her, why are you here? I fought with my boyfriend. I'm very sad. My mother told me to go out in the streets and clear my head. So that's why I'm here. And I can tell you, because I spent hours walking out on Avenida Paulista to ask why people were there. So a small number were there because of the bus fare. The movement. The, the, the free transport movement were there to have a go at the left. And others were there for all sorts of reasons because they had received a call on the internet. So then the mayor took a step back, didn't raise the fare. So the movement called on their cell phones a celebration on the avenue. And there they go everybody to celebrate, but this time, unlike the previous ones, the free transport movement that is not a party political, their members started expressing also with their party symbols, and everybody took their banner. And then there was a group wrapped up in the national flag of Brazil and hit, beat up, and bled, and sent to the hospital the kids from the free transport movement. 
the following demonstration was what it was. The third one was already clearly a far-right movement, fascistic, full of hate. Uh, not nothing good would come of that. And I did. I, I I said this publicly. I was foolish enough to say this in public, and I was nearly lynched. I hadn't realized the revolution, the 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 change that was taking place in Brazil at the time. What was being prepared? That was the 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 general rehearsal of the coup. In fact, so 2013 was not not the emergence or the re-emergence of the strength of the people's movements, the social movements that had been dormant during the Workers' Party administration. So MBL, the free transport movement, has to reflect upon this. It wasn't a reawakening. It was new people there that formed a, a torrent that raised everything that I was talking about here, about that neoliberalism produces with the idea of the emperors of themselves. So raise this narcissistic subjectivity full of guilt, hate, and resentment to hit whoever appeared in front. So the political forces that were uh, ready, the right-wing political forces, to, to benefit, to hitch a ride, so to speak, in all of this. And they took the ball and ran with it. So this, this is all to say what happens sometimes in Brazil when we think, think that we are facing something that is uh, a liberating strength, but in fact we are faced with tradition, family, property always, because that is the way in which you mask our corruption that is a formative element of our society. Thank you.